Awesome. So thanks for having me down. My name is Dan Gunner, um, and today we're going to be talking about crash override. So we'll talk a little of, um, about what it is if you aren't familiar. Um, so a little about me, I just left the Air Force about four months ago. And so uh, leaving the Air Force and then starting with a company and finding nation state level malware um, and having to reverse engineer it in 72 hours, it was a fun six week start to uh, kind of changing jobs. And so this was kind of, uh, we found out about this in six months starting. So I was in the Air Force, worked at Baylor when I was a student there a little. Um, and then moved on now to Dragos, and so we're all industrial control system security. I'm also doing the uh, SANS master program, so if you have GI Bill, you can use your GI Bill to pay basically a bunch of SANS certs out, so definitely look at it if you need a way to fund $5,000 courses. So, <laughs> an overview. So we'll talk about what the uh, crash override in the Ukraine 2015 and 2016 attacks. We'll talk about how the power grid works, if you're not familiar with kind of some of the intricacies so you can understand it. We'll go over the specifically crash override was the 2016 malware that was used um, in that outage. We'll do a demo. My goal is to keep the slides around 20 minutes and then have the demo be the back half um, so we can be interactive and actually see it run. I actually have uh, simulated um, servers here that I'll pull up for uh, showing actually how the malware works and then we'll have a Q&A. If you do have questions, feel free to pop your hand up and we'll answer them also during it. So in 2015, um, in December, both of these attacks were in December, the power in Ukraine went out for about three and a half hours and this was a median outage. And there were, there were about 225 customers that were impacted, three utilities and 50 substations. If you look at the load here, it was only 135 which is kind of interesting when we look in 2016. In 2015, the attacks were heavily, um, the actors getting on the box and using RDP. So they were actually having to have someone set at the keyboard and kind of drive around the human machine interface, the HMI, to actually cause the impacts. That was 2015. 2016, which is a crash override malware, they went after one actual uh, transmission company and one substation. And they were able to actually achieve a larger power outage, larger quantity. Um, they were only able to do it for about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, a lot of that was because the utility was actually ready and uh, was able to switch off a lot of their kind of automated system control and switch into manual mode. But we do want to point out that in this case, the attacker only had to go basically to one transmission company to achieve a larger outage. The other thing with this, instead of actually having to have someone on the keyboard, because as an attacker that limits the kind of quantity that you can go after, this actually used malware. And so that's the malware we're looking at today. So if you're not familiar with how um, power generation and how the grid works, you basically have your generating stations. And so there's generation, so whether it be wind, nuclear, solar, that's kind of the generation level. And then you have a substation and transmission that pops to transmission. And all those big lines you see um, down the highway, those are the big transmission lines. And that moves bulk power basically around um, the entire uh, region or around that grid. So with transmission, you'll have substations. And then you'll have another transformer substation that actually puts down for distribution. And so when you see kind of the uh, power uh, substation in your neighborhood, it's probably going to be a distribution one that's pushing out to like businesses, to houses and all that. In 2015, the attacks went after generation, or after, sorry, after the distribution. And so that was essentially kind of the substations that affects just neighborhoods. In 2016, they went after transmission. And so this is the actual bulk power. And that's why they were able to achieve a larger quantity. When you look at that, it's really just you know different quantities. So here they're actually stepping up. They're uh, concentrating to push large amounts of power over. This is less power. So actually in one of these substations, this is kind of how it'll work. And so this diagram is actually from one of the Ukrainian automation vendors. And so this is actually how substation networks are rolled out in the Ukraine today. The thing I wanna point out 
is protocols. And so you have protocols like 101. So this goes over a serial connection. You have 104, which is what we're dem demoing today. That's 101 that's just going over TCP IP. And so the actual packet on the wire is the same when you look at it. It's just serial versus ethernet. You have other protocols down here, like let's find some of the other ones. Um, yeah, sometimes you'll have Modbus. Um, and so really within these networks, there's kind of different protocols that are being used depending on where you're at. You also have uh, systems like this, so the 6600. And it looks like a rack, but in truth, this runs Windows. Um, luckily, now the mint vendors have upgraded to where they don't support Windows XP on this anymore. You'll be glad to know. Um, but that was kind of a recent change in the last few years. A lot of this, when you dive in the vendor manuals, you're looking at Windows 7, Windows 8, and I, um, yeah, and sometimes Windows 10. So Windows system, Windows system, and then down here is when you start getting into your embedded devices. And so when you talk about malware and what actually works against these systems, it turns out you can use commodity malware on a lot of this up here. And it's only when you're actually getting into these protocols do you actually have to learn to send whatever packet you're trying to send. <clears throat> so what was used in the 2016 attack? It was a modular framework. And so the primary parts of it were these main back doors and then they had an additional back door that actually hit in notepad. This back door, it didn't have any zero days and so a lot of people were instantly like, this isn't sophisticated. But at this point in the intrusion, the attackers already had all the credentials they needed. And so they didn't need zero days to kind of stay on the network. They had everything to stay in place. This main back door installs a launcher, and all the launcher really does is call DLL files that export the crash function, hence why it's called crash override. And this launcher is able to launch a data wiper. And then if you see those protocols we talked about earlier, 101, 104, 61, 850, OPC, OPC is used a lot between your uh, HMIs, your human machine interfaces. And so when you go into some of these industrial networks, OPC, and this is the older version, OPC DA. OPC DA is a big in situational awareness. And so if you start kind of mucking with that, you muck with situational awareness. If you muck with 101 or 104, this is actually how they were opening and closing breakers at the substation. And so this opens breakers. This just changes kind of what shows up often on the uh, human machine interface on the HMI. We left the question marks here because with this being modular, these are not the only protocols that um, we know that this certain adversary has been working on. These protocols here, why this wouldn't work in North America right now is we use different protocols generally at this deck. And so this level of protocols worked in the Ukraine because that's what they use. And so that's something uh, important to point out there. And so for this, we were able to examine the back door. We had the launcher, we had the wiper, and we had the 104 module. Right now, we're, not, we're unsure of anyone that actually has the 101, 61, 850, or OPC outside of the original team that actually did the investigation. So right now, if you were looking for these out on the internet, you'll probably find 104 in these, but if you do find these other ones, let us know. <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. So we're not sure, we only saw, so that's a good question. So the question was how did the initial kind of infection start? And unfortunately with this, all of this was compiled literally three hours before the outages. And so this is the effects toolkit. This is what the attacker threw onto the machines when it was game day to actually cause the impact. We don't actually have any of the uh, kind of intrusion or the reconnaissance um, all of that malware that was used to building up. This is designed to be caught. Um, some was packed. 
just so the main back door, I believe, was packed, but everything else was wide open. All these had strings and everything throughout, so. Well, this was uh, this was just cause of cause the action at the end and be, um, to actually uh, um, be caught. So, because at this point, I mean, they're, you're able to pull this off. They took all of their tools and cleaned up before this point. So, does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yep. And something interesting though is you do see different styles. Um, that does bring up, it is kind of interesting that there was different code protection on like this part than on this part. And even within the 104 module, which we'll see in a second, there's even ways that they made that, um, that modular suggesting that there were multiple development teams or the coding styles were too different when we analyzed them, so. But the back door, so the back door, that first part, it directly communicated out actually to a proxy address in the network. And so they actually had the proxy, the local proxy hard coded. And so what that, st or what that pointed out to us is that they had really done their homework and been there and that this was actually purpose driven for this network. If it could get to that proxy, then it had several Tor nodes that it would actually try to do C2 with. We weren't actually able to see where it reached out to those Tor nodes, um, but we did actually see those Tor IPs hard-coded in, and then it could beacon out to receive instructions. The persistence, it would just set itself up as a service, and so outside of that, there wasn't really anything intricate there. So the launcher module, so this is what executed the payload and those wipers, so the actual uh, industrial protocols. And so it would create a service, it would spawn a wiper thread, and this wiper thread had an hour cooldown before it actually started running the wiper. And we'll talk about how the wiper works on the next slide. It would then call the uh, exported crash function of that DLL of the dynamically linked library, which would actually be the code, so w whether it be the uh, IEC 104, the um, protocol um, server, it would wait for that to finish, and then the main part would actually end, although the wiper thread would stay. So how the wiper worked, it worked a lot of the same way, but it would actually zero out the registry key for the image path, and so this makes the system unbootable. It still allows the system to run, but this is what tells basically Windows when you boot up where all the key um, files are, or where all the key files are to start the services. It would then start erasing files, uh, and we'll cover the extensions in the next one, and then it would begin to kill processes off. So the file extensions, and this is another one that was interesting. This was very targeted towards the technology that was used in the Ukrainian substation in that specific one. PCM 600 is a very specific uh, ABB product. Um, and so the attackers very much went after very specific files that they knew would be there. You then also had some other files that are probably more commonly found, but this piece of malware specifically went after um, configurations for ABB uh, for the PCM 600. Interestingly, it targeted also share drives, so it went after C through U and W through Z. We're not sure why they ignored V, A, B, or V, um, but you would have been safe, I guess, if your files were at A, B, or V. Um, it targeted specific system files, and then, uh, as I point out, that point of emphasis was there. So the payload modules, these, this is where it's interesting because this is where it shows that the attackers actually had knowledge or basic knowledge of how the ICS protocols work. Um, and again, they shipped as DLLs, and they use that exported crash function. We saw this before. So as I said, IEC 104, it's a TCP version of 101. It's not a very complicated packet. This is the 101 um, packet. 
Um, it can either be master slave initiated or the master can send. So this means that basically all you have to be on is either a master or slave and depending on configuration, you might be able to do this um, either from the master or from the slave depending on how it's set up. A few key terms before we get into the next part is ASDU. These are basically kind of groups um, of these addresses in there. And then IOAs are registers. And so we'll see the registers flip from uh, on or off during the demo. So execution flow, how these modules would work is once that exported crash function was c called, you would basically have a client th that would kick off that would actually do the work. So actually kill the legitimate communications process for the industrial protocol on that box. It would create a socket and then it would begin sending data. And at some point it would call also an exported crash function on a uh, to wipe things. Okay, so demo time. So on the demo, um, I use the IEC 104 server by JKL. This is just an um, open source product that's available out on SourceForge for free. And I'll point out that the attacker victim machines are updated Windows 10, so there's no shenanigans with those. Any questions while it's booting? Cool. Cool. So this is that IEC 104 test server. What I'm doing is I'm loading it in a configuration and so as you can see, um, the ASDU are kind of that group of registers. It's all in group one. And then you'll see uh, uh, IOAs or their IOBs here. I have a one, two, three, four, and five. Two of these values are on right now and three are off. Infected. You can see I have a 104 DLL, which is that payload module we were talking about earlier, um, that actually is able to send IEC 104 data. I have a config file. Let me see. I'll try to blow that up. But on the config file, so something to point out with this is like we said in 2015, they had to actually be there. In 2016, all they had to do was have a valid config file and get basically the DLL onto the box. And so this is also worrisome because now if they have to get over something like an air gap or like that, now they just have to ship basically these files and find a way to do that. But with the configuration file, the, um, the attacker gave a target IP a port. They could give it a log file, and this log file is actually what's used by the payload modules. You would give it an ASDU or kind of those groups of um, different IOS. You could say, do you stop the comm service? So when we said it'll kill the process, if that's the one, it'll actually kill the process. What changes is change says, are you actually going to flip the values on or off in a loop? And so when this starts in that actual loop, um, if this was true, then it would actually flip the values between on and off using the first action as your starting point. And so with this setting, it's going to change all of the values on the uh, test server, and it's initially going to turn them all off. Silence uh, just prevents some logging. Um, stop comm service is actually the uh, process that it'll try to stop. And so with this, they would just have to put in whatever the legitimate actual process running the uh, industrial protocol um, server would be. And they would 
for uh, operation. So operation, there's range, there's shift. And uh, so with range, what it does is it works in this range of addresses. So I said it on the past one that we had a kind of addresses one through five. And so this is targeting one through three right now. So four and five should say stay unchanged. What range does is range will go through and it, uh, it'll actually enumerate out to the uh, server and it'll make sure that the register values actually exist initially. And then once those values actually exist, once it goes through all three of these, that's when it actually kicks off the infinite loop that if change is on, turns it on and off. And if change isn't on, it just repeatedly sends whatever the first action is. So shift, the difference is shift does everything range does, but shift, you can provide it an offset and where you think other addresses are. And it'll do everything that range does, and then it'll begin to actually enumerate the other register values to see if there are other values it can turn on and off. So this PowerShell window is going to be uh, basically tailing the log file. And so as the log file on the, uh, um, as the log file is logging, um, you'll see it down there. <clears throat> and then uh, 104 launcher is the launcher we have to actually run it. So let me make sure, so our server's up. We're actually going to run. There we go. So you'll notice something about this and something that's interesting to say. So we're already getting start. Um, we're starting to see data output. What's interesting with this, and it kind of goes back to the question that was asked earlier, is parts of this, and now you see data coming through. So this Wireshark window is basically, uh, it's a capture filter only looking at the uh, port 2404 traffic. And so traffic's flowing now. But what's interesting with this too, and why we think there were multiple people that, uh, or multiple groups that actually were involved, development teams, is there are parts that have strings, there are parts that there's absolutely no effort to hide it. And then there are parts where they definitely did, you know, they packed it, they took out strings, they made it a little harder to study. Um, and that's kind of interesting because when, when you see this, you don't expect to actually see here's, strings and so a lot of our YAR rules that we pushed out were based on these strings actually being in the binary. Um, that was just kind of an interesting finding um, that we found on that. So as I said initially it's searching, searching for those control signals. The other thing with this is it's really um, slow which is a little surprising. They actually have sleeps in the code to wait and so instead of continually sending um, packets out, they've actually backed off so not to crash anything. <clears throat> so as it's running, any other questions? We'll put that over there. So anytime you see this go to a zero, it means uh Basically, the breaker is being turned off, so the re or that area is losing power. When you see one or two or three turn to a one, it means that breaker is, uh, or sorry, it's opening and they're losing power. If it's a one, it's closing, and so that means there's actually power fl flowing through. So right now, it just found register one. It's looking for two.
Question? Yeah. So we don't have any attribution outside of, uh, um, we don't do kind of nation state level. We do think that the Electrum group is what we've termed them, or termed them, does have times, ties to uh, the Sandworm team. So that's kind of the only um, attribution. But as far as, uh, as far as kind of the rise, we weren't involved in actually going out. In 2015, uh, one of the guys, Rob Lee from our company, did go out. But uh, 2016, we weren't actually involved uh, on the ground. So, um, yeah. I think so is what is uh, open source. Yeah. <laughs> So once it finds all three, it'll get more interesting, I promise. Sorry. <laughs> Probably a little of both. Um, when it comes to uh, some of the systems can be pretty brittle. And so especially like when you're going in and assessing some of these sites, you often aren't allowed to scan for that very reason. And so some of it is uh, just making sure you're not crashing. And some of it's probably um, just staying under the radar a little. Um, we're not exactly sure on all of it, but that's kind of our guess. So the question was, um, was the impact kind of the maximum they could do? And with this configuration, yes. Um, just because um, something that was interesting was that the head of the, uh, U or of the Ukrainian energy company in that area basically said, you know, we saw this, uh, or we saw our automation systems basically start acting up pretty quickly. And, you know, within 30 to 45 minutes, they were already switching stuff. And that's why power came back on in under an hour. So um, with with what they have here, this is probably the limit on uh, with this specific capability. Yeah. So we didn't go, or one of our guys was involved in another team that went out in 2015. Um, so I'm not sure exactly uh, what they were tied to, but um, yeah. But they had rehearsed. Um, the reason why it went from three to one hours in our kind of analysis is they had rehearsed this going down. The first outage in 2015 was December 23rd, and the uh, 2016 outage was December 17th, so it was six days earlier. And so we're kind of curious if December 11th will be, this year will be kind of the third series, if they stick with that. So now it's found all three. It kicks out a message starting only success. And so this is now where it'll actually go into a loop. And uh, you'll see Duns as, it, as it's actually sending out um, activation messages to turn these values on and off. So you have, uh, so, so the question was, uh, do a lot of the systems run the same architectures? And it can really vary, because there are academic models like the Purdue model, um, whereas you kind of have your layer um, 
five and four, which are more managed by maybe the IT staff at an area. And so five is going to be a lot of your uh, corporate network. Um, four is going to be kind of more uh, plant focused corporate network. Three is where a lot of your human machine interfaces, a lot of your HMIs, your historians, which store a lot of data, um, those type of uh, systems for the actual uh, production network live. That's uh, considered by the operations technology staff, so layer three. And then uh, two and one is a lot where your PLCs live. Um, so in like refining and um, like gold mines will use it. That's kind of, they're, they're able to stick with it more with power. It's a lot of the same. Um, there are differences depending on where you're at, so. But generally none of your um, kind of production networks, um, they're not air gapped, but it's very rare to see ones that'll actually touch the internet. You have to go through um, quite a few firewalls or quite a few layers of uh, security. So. Cool. It should for. So one of the big challenges while it's going to change too with that is uh, a lot of these networks you can't apply patches and you can't do a lot of that until you enter maintenance windows which, which uh, you know that that works for refining when they actually have maintenance windows but with uh, with like power you can't just say hey San Antonio we're shutting off the power so we can apply patches um, and so there's obviously some industry differences um, when you kind of go between silos on um, you know, those different. So now you see, so it's, that was the first one, as we said, was the initial uh, switch values off. Now it's switching values on. And so now you're seeing um, ones actually appear up here. So you should see two get a one. What was kind of interesting with this, uh, I actually worked for the Air Force CERT before. And what's interesting with this is this is very scanny to me. And so if you look at for traffic and you see, hey, someone's jumping register one and waiting, register two and waiting, um, you, you can pull some really good forensics off of what patient zero is just kind of looking on how this works. This wasn't a very sophisticated, I want to say, um, approach, but it did work. So maybe that's sophisticated in itself. <coughs> Question in the back? What's yeah. No, no uh, forensics on the, no, we don't have anything on the initial intrusion so far. We haven't seen anything uh, come out publicly either. So. What's that? No one's claimed it. No. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, and that's where it's tricky with some of this because there's no there's no exploits being used in this, right? They're just sending, they're just sending packets. And a lot of these protocols are exactly that. They're, uh, you know, unauthenticated and just sent out there. And so, um, and that's where, 
it would be really nice if we did have the initial malware because that's where all the sophistication is. Um, kind of the question being asked earlier, this very much just has to be very simple to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, but yep. What's that? Um, for file. So the question was, if they were running something like Tripwire, um, would they be, have been able to see this? And that would depend on a kind of, um, I guess it would depend on, uh, it would depend on the configuration, right? Because there are DLLs being called. There's definite uh, forensic evidence out there. So these DLLs, sorry, these DLLs were all written by them. So these aren't common. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so that, it's kind of speculative because this wouldn't, so obviously because of the protocols, this wouldn't work. Um, but I mean, theoretically, if they did the R&D to figure out the protocols and what they needed to send on the wire, and they were able to get into to, uh, you know US companies, they could do it. But there's a lot of kind of ifs there that are going to require uh, a lot of legwork. Yes. So the question is, uh, is kind of the diversity of the U.S. and correct me if I'm wrong on this. Do we have kind of the um, depth and breadth of defense and diversity on our grid to kind of prevent a cascading kind of outage with this? Um, we think we think yes. Um, that said, I'm still I'm somewhat new to this, so I can connect you to some of our people that um, can probably give a better answer than I can. But uh, it would be a much different scenario and there would be a lot more uh, different engineering involved in pulling it off um, kind of on the rolling level. So, <laughs> yeah. So now you're seeing the ones change back to zeros. Other question? It's flipping switches outside of the wiper. Um, it's just, that's all it's doing. It sounds really cool, but when you look at it, it's very simple. Yeah. This happened, um, so this happened around midnight, I believe. Um, and so what had happened is, uh, what was really nice is they compiled this in Visual Studio and they had wiped out a lot of the, or they had zeroed out a lot of the timestamps um, and a lot of the uh, DLLs and everything, but they still had uh, like debug mode and other stuff enabled. So there were other timestamps that they hadn't wiped out. And so that's how we kind of knew that all of this, all of the payloads, um, 
and everything that was detected was basically compiled within three hours of um, the outage. So that's where we're getting those timestamps. So, yep, question in the back. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, so, um, Yeah, so big question was uh, kind of what um, what specific kind of stations did this target? And this was completely a transmission set up, one transmission substation. So, yep, just one. What's that? Sorry, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. Might be easier to have them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the question was, uh, since we don't know, kind of, since we don't have the initial kind of attack vector, was there any analysis done on kind of the holes coming in? And uh, something to point out, both for both Dragos and uh, if you saw the Black Hat talk for ESAD, who put the report out at the um, same time, um, neither of us were actually involved in the official investigation um, in any way, and so, there was, it's all kept right now inside the Ukrainian government. And so that's where, when we were talking about the actual modules that are out, as far as we see, the security community only has the 104 and those other modules. Um, the other modules clearly exist because the ESET report was able to see those other modules, but we don't, that's through some other partnership. So we're not sure how they have that. <laughs> Nope, we have no clue on uh, any of that. Yeah. Yep. And so the question or the comment kind of was, uh, you know, with things like the strings being left in and uh, kind of the sophistication when you're printing this much stuff out and all that, it seems like a test. And uh, we definitely, some of our analysis definitely agrees with that, that um, with how modular this is, um, we think this is probably only some of what they can do. Yeah. Probably.
And the other interesting thing to kind of point out with this is, uh, and what's interesting to me is, in order to put this together, you already kind of have to have an understanding. Uh, you have to have an understanding in uh, a lot of ways, if you wanna make sure it actually works, you have to have a way to test it. And so you need to have both kind of your computer science malware developer type people that actually know how to build things like backdoors, um, launchers, all of that. And then you need people that understand safety systems and uh, some of those systems that might be at play. And so to, to me at least, this is kind of a multidisciplinary team. Um, you aren't going to find a 16 year old or many at least that's just going to be like, hey, you know, let me start writing, you know, let me start writing malware that can take down a grid or a steel mill. There's, there's more knowledge and a lot with that, you kind of get into the cognitive bias of, uh, of just how much you know of the knowledge bias. Cause once you, once you read and understand, it seems easy to you, but it's not always as straightforward um, as it seems. So definite sophistication there. So the forensics we used, the question was, can we talk about some of the forensics we used? And so how this basically went down is on uh, on Thursday, um, we got basically initial tipping that ETSAT was going to put out a report on Monday. We didn't get any of the samples, we got the hash values. And so we took the hash values and on Thursday we were able to um, locate the hash values. On Thursday night, we bought a Ida Pro and hex rays and so, Spent about four grand on those. Um, we spent about 48 hours ripping it apart in Ida Pro. Um, at that time, we didn't have everything running. Um, we were just basically doing the analysis on what we had. So in 48 hours, we did the analysis and we had another 48 hours to kind of generate the report. And so a lot of our initial analysis was all done in Ida Pro. Now, obviously, we have things like Wireshark and, um, but it was kind of a 48 hour rush to, uh, um, figure it all out. So. Yep. So it was a configuration file sp specifically for the ABM PC or ABB PCM 600. And so, whoops. so the attackers knew the, to us, the attackers had done their recon and they knew exactly the systems they were going for. This wasn't something where it was, you know, just generically wiping a lot out. The wiper was very targeted for the industrial environment. Um, and that's where this is kind of different because uh, as we term it, this is the fourth case where there's industrial control system specific malware. And so things like Stuxnet, Havix, um, and crash overrides, so. So I'm not sure, I'll say we found the files are all over virus total. And so someone accidentally pushed them up to virus total. So <laughs> yeah, so we're not sure how they ended up there, but question up there. So question was, uh, is there any evidence of insiders? And again, we're not sure, um, cause we would need kind of the initial um, initial um, analysis to know on that, but, um, and it's tricky now because, you know, if they, if the same group in 2015 did it in 2016, that means now they've been there at least year, two years, chances are they've been there much longer. And so, um, I mean, they have the advantage of probably knowing the network better than um, a lot of the people at the site. <laughs> So, that's a good question. So, uh, um, there is, so we're, we're, 
I guess the group's actually been going in. Steven, do you want to come up and talk a little? <laughs> it's another meetup that, uh, yeah, yeah, so. This um, meetup started back in December at San Antonio and uh, Cybersecurity for Industrial Control Systems. And it's just been about three or four guys showing up at a brewery and just talking about uh, just we done things on attack vectors. Uh, we did something on the Internet of Things, like how it was streaming out an IP address. Um, the guy who was running the group left to North Carolina, so I've taken over. Uh, Dan stepped in to help out, which has been great. Um, we're trying to grow the group. We're gonna, our next meeting is going to be at uh, at Geekdom on August 31st at 6:30 on the uh, seventh floor in the Tron conference room. So <clears throat> this is becoming a bigger topic. So uh, the community wants information. So this is a meetup for people to learn, network. Uh, we want to get more people from the industrial control sector coming to this uh, and connecting with security people on the IT side uh, for more collaboration stuff like that. So we all invite you to join the group and come out. Uh, our topic on the 31st is going to be uh, going to be security uh, for a cardio defibrillator um, using smartphones to tokenize and and that's I'm not the expert, but that's what we have a PhD candidate who's going to talk about his thesis. So we'd like to thank you for uh, giving us the time. Questions or thoughts, even corrections. Cool. So yeah, if you do have questions, come up. Um, yeah. 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 Yeah, so these specific three files are only are only tied. They're tied to the ABM PC PCM 600 project file, and so these are only with a very specific control system um, out there. Because when we got the big list, and the the list is actually a lot longer, we cut it down to the ones that were just ICS targeted, and these really stuck out because. Yeah, you're going to expect to see kind of the generic extensions, but not very vendor and product specific extensions. You know, that's very targeted. <laughs> Question? Yep. So the question was, does the wiper, is it designed to take out config files and clean it up after itself? And basically, yes, it is. So it'll take out the key Windows files, and then it'll take out these config files and try to do it on your uh, share drive. So, cool. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, that would be interesting to see, um, again, why it didn't hit V. Because we thought initially if it was an international keyboard, or we had crazy kind of reasons that we came up with, but we don't really have, we're not sure. So the question was, uh, um, is it possible that, or do, would you repeat it? Yeah. The other fun point you asked on analysis earlier is uh, going from a 300,000 per 300, person organization to we literally have two people that are E. And so it's fun when you're uh, one of two people to do it. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> cool. Any other questions regarding the security? 
Awesome. Thanks. Oh, one more. Which OS were they running? Um, Windows. Probably Windows. I'm not sure which version. So if it was a newer version, then it was probably beyond, uh, at least to the control system, it was beyond XP, but there's a chance it was still. So. What's that? Sorry, I can't. So the question is, uh, since it can be reused, do we have uh, indicators of compromise and that type of stuff? We did put out uh, um, ER rules, and uh, since then, actually, the um, U.S. government's put out an even better list, kind of, or a more extensive list of ER rules. And so there's a lot of ER rules out there. The other thing is, uh, if I was, if I were to actually connect this and turn Windows Defender on, Windows Defender wipes out all of the modules, and so. Microsoft and uh, on virus total, I think everyone detects it now. So um, that's kind of one of the trade offs because there's a trade off between giving a nation state or an adversary kind of the post game talk and here's what you did wrong versus actually talking about it. But in talking about it, the advantage is exactly that. Now there are really good indicators and you know a lot better understanding of at least how it worked at the end. Um, it would be nice, obviously, to see kind of how it worked initially. Sorry, what was that? Oh. So, so, so the question is, uh, and there was a Reddit thread about it, um, the coffee maker that um, infected the industrial plant. and. As far as now, we haven't seen anything actual credible outside of kind of the Reddit story. Yeah, we're not sure on that. We haven't heard. Um. Was it? Yeah, because I know Reddit, like they had some crazy ideas too that a vendor had like typed in the Wi-Fi or connected it to the industrial Wi-Fi and yeah. So. Well, thanks a lot, and if you have questions, feel free to come up or um, send me an email. It's really easy if you just send it. You can either do dgunner, or we're small enough to where if you just send to dan at dragos.com, it'll come to me. So if you have questions or ideas, um, definitely shoot me a message. What's that? Yeah, yeah. I'm the only person here in town, so. Awesome. Thank you.